Good morning, everybody. How are you? So good to be here with you this morning. So good to hear the sounds of people greeting each other and 
milling around after so long being apart. It's great to be back together. We've got quite a few still coming in. Wow. Well, we're going to worship together this morning. We're going to sing some traditional songs. Uh, I don't know. That's just it's how it struck me this morning. And uh, I wanted to start off with just a little, just a little, uh, I'm certainly not a philologist. That's uh, that's a word. How's that for a new word for you to uh, work into conversation? Philology is the study of words and the origins and all that stuff. But the word rejoice, as comes from uh, an, an old French word and then a Middle English word. I, I know how to operate Google. That's all it is. Uh, but rejoice means the re is to feel it with an intense an intensity it, it, it denotes uh, uh, intensity on the beginning of joy to experience joy intensely is what rejoice means <clears throat> so when when the song says re, when these all these Christmas songs we hear rejoice it's not just a no oh, we're we're pretty happy about that it's it's intense joy that we're experiencing and so <clears throat> This song, Joy to the World, that's, that is uh, what I want us to think about. The joy with intensity. <clears throat> As I said to the band while we were praying this morning, the entire world is singing these songs about the birth of Jesus. And many people who are singing these songs in popular music, you'll hear it on the radio, they don't know the Lord at all. They don't know Jesus as their savior. But here they are singing these songs about the truth of the gospel and the coming of Jesus. They have no idea what they're even singing. They're proclaiming the glory of God without their, they don't even know it. And so it, it's, it's a time to rejoice. I want us to come together and just sing and uh, just think about the, that God sent his son to us. to experience everything, what it was like to be a person. The Bible said he was tempted in every way that we are, but was without sin. He had to experience things, life as us. So man, it's great joy. So let's sing together this morning.
nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. see the fulfillment of the prophecy. I can only imagine uh, when, when Zacharias heard about it. I, I just can't, I can't even imagine uh, what, what that must have felt like to finally see the fulfillment with your own eyes what you've been praying for, the coming of Jesus. It's amazing. I know you all know this one. Let's sing it with sing it with us. Oh holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Oh,
There's some up at the front, where you can get a buddy to come and get you one. For those of you who may not know me, my name is um, Liliana, and um, I'm one of the young adults here, and I have the pleasure of serving in a couple of different places around Belmont. Um, 
And I'm actually going to piggyback off what you said earlier <laughs> about the communion message. That apparently is what we need to be talking about this morning. Um, there are two things, there are two kind of bookend actions that I think surround this sacrifice that we celebrate when we take communion. The first one, and I think the beauty of the sacrifice, is that Jesus chose to be born as a baby. You know, he could have come as, as an adult. He could have come with only a year or six months left to, left to teach, and then he could have saved us all in a blaze of glory. Um, but he didn't. He chose to come as a baby so that he could live and he could learn and he could grow and he could teach and he could love and experience all the same things that we experience. Which I think took a lot of patience. I don't know about you, but I'm not somebody who typically is patient when there's a hard thing to do. So I think it says a lot about who our God is that he would choose to wait that long to go through a hard thing so that we could know that he knows what it's like to be us. And the second book, and actually the other end, is the fact that once he did the sacrifice, once he gave his life, he chose not to stay dead. He is not dead. And because of that, we have a high priest who is sitting next to the Father, sitting at the right hand of the Father, advocating for us, who intimately knows what it is like to be us, who can advocate for our sins, who took all of that to the cross because he knows how hard it is to do this. So from the same thing you referenced earlier, Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points was tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So friends, I'm gonna give you just a moment and we're all gonna receive communion on our own, but um, I would encourage you to take just a second to acknowledge and let it sink deep the intimate saving grace of this sacrifice. That it is not a, it's an overarching thing, but it is an intimate thing for you for right now. You may receive the bread and the cup when you're ready. Oh. 
Invite the Harden family up now for our Advent reading. The 
It takes us a, a minute. There's a lot of us. Uh, we're so uh, privileged to, to be here and share the Advent reading with you today. Um, the prophet Isaiah foretold Messiah's coming 700 years before the event. For centuries, many looked forward with joy, knowing that what the Lord had promised would eventually come to pass. Isaiah 35.10 And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And Isaiah 49-11 O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our Lord. May the joyful promise of your presence, O oh God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. 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 There you go. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all so much. <laughs> well, I'd like to invite you all now to, uh, we're going to read together. Uh, a prayer um, and we'll pray this I believe the words will be up there so you can follow along mighty, mighty God, God you sent your prophets God. to preach and prepare the way for our salvation give us the wisdom to heed their warnings and forsake our sins that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ our Redeemer Make ready our hearts for the brightness of your glory and the fullness of your blessings in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen. Amen. Check one, two. One of these will work. I'm certain. I have full... Trust in Mike. Take your mic. Yeah, go for it. Check out. As I said, Mike is the man. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and amen. Um, my name is Dan Wathke. I'm the administrative pastor here at Belmont, and it's my pleasure to worship with you guys. Um, so, like many of you, um, late Friday night, Saturday morning, about 2.30, we were hunkered down in our closet all the kids and pillows and flashlights and everything ready and uh, very fortunate um, that uh, the storm passed over um, but not everybody today can say that so we want to take some time i've asked janice and um, mary b if they would come and just lead us in prayer um, let's go before the lord uh, with thankful hearts and yet with heavy hearts for those who are uh, in in a bad shape this morning uh, he is good um, but they definitely need our prayers uh, as they walk through this. So. Amazing God, we just um, come to you today on behalf of um, all those who have experienced loss. We, we thank you that you have um, come and experienced everything. So you are right there and you know what they're going through. We speak your peace, your shalom over them. We speak blessing of um, receiving your comfort and your peace. We know that um, many who've experienced loss are believers and many are not. 
And so we just um, bless you to encounter them, every one of them, that they would um, run to you in this place of loss and um, just experience you in new ways, God. We, we bless the church, our church and the church of Jesus Christ yes, to rise up yes. and um, join in uh, physical blessing and in blessing of, uh, of prayer, of, of holding these people up um, in our state and in surrounding states who, who, truly, who truly need you in this moment. Yes. Father, your word says, rejoice, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Lord, I thank you and praise you that we're calling upon the peace that passes human understanding and the joy that only you can bring right now, Father, in Jesus' name. For where we are weak, you are strong, and we give you full permission to show out on our behalf during this time in the name of Jesus. There's so many that have needs, Lord God, and you will satisfy every need. We thank you and praise you, Lord God, that there will be a fill of these people with a joy, a peace that passes understanding, and a joy that only you can bring, Lord God. I thank you and praise you, Lord God, for this even now in the name of Jesus. Just a special covering over them even now as they are, uh, are bringing their lives back together and they're trying to figure out how things are going to move forward, Lord God. You are the answer, and we stretch our arms out to you now, asking you for the answer, Lord God. You have provision for them, and we receive it even now for them in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray uh, you would be near um, to everybody. I pray, Father, that um, I, I just love, Lord, uh, that yes, we would rise up. We would rise up. We would be a light, Father. I'd be near to those those people who are on the ground working. Be near to, um, Lord, I pray for divine appointments with insurance agents and uh, all the logistical things that come with just rebuilding. Uh, and, Father, be near, especially to those who are hurting today. Um, stir in us, Lord, that we can be active in advancing your kingdom through compassion and kindness for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you guys know of anybody um, firsthand or if you yourself had firsthand uh, damage, don't hesitate to reach out, okay? It's one of the things as a church we're called to be as a light in dark times. So do not hesitate to reach out myself or Rachel, any of the elders or staff. We would um, be glad to uh, step in and help. Um, I'm going to audible real quick. Liliana, come up here real quick. She doesn't know I'm doing this, but... Um, this is Liliana Napier, uh, and she, yes, she has served this last semester as an intern for our Abide group, which is Abide is 18 and up, young adult area, and uh, has done a marvelous job. And I heard you just graduated yesterday. Is that accurate? From MTSU. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview you really quick on the spot here. So, um, what are your plans next? What, what did, first of all, what did you graduate? What's your degree in? Oh, I have, what does it say on my, I think it says on the certificate, I have a Bachelor of Business Administration with a major in management, which is just business management. Excellent. And what, do you, what are your plans now? What do, you, do you know? Do you have something lined up? Are you... I don't know. I have just finished my resume and am now stepping into the full-time job of applying for a job. Okay. So that right. is what my Christmas vacation Excellent. looks Excellent. like. And is it common to graduate in December? No. I wrote a senior thesis, which pushed back stuff a little bit. Cause okay. Okay. I, yeah. So, Merry Christmas to you then. Yes. Thank All right, you. extend your hands. She served us so well, guys, and she uh, her gift of administration really came through and just helping us establish some core things and abide how we do it, how we going forward. So thank you, uh, Liliana, for all the work and Rachel as well and working with her. Okay, Father, thank you. 
Thank you, Lord, for, uh, I love, Father, how you place kingdom-minded, kingdom-hearted people in the workspace, in the business world. And we pray this favor on her, Father. We pray you would direct her next steps, that, Father, they would be for your glory, that there would be uh, just amazing appointments, amazing opportunities, Lord. Uh, and, Father, I just thank you. I pray protection over Liliana, over her heart, Lord, that she would just continue to keep this boldness and freshness and um, first love, you at the point of all those things, Lord. We bless her, Father. We bless the work of her hands. We bless her mind. And Lord, we just ask that um, your favor would rest upon her. You would guide her steps for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lillian. So if you are a guest in this house, I just invite you to fill out this card. There's, it's in the seat back in front of you. And uh, you can drop it off to Donna out there in the welcome desk here in just a minute. We've got a gift for you. It also just helps us get you plugged in. And if you're online, you can do the same. Just go to belmont.org slash I'm new. And on the back side of this, we also have prayer requests and or comments, suggestions, ideas, things the Lord's stirring. Feel free. Anybody can fill those out. You can drop those to Donna or in the basket. Um, I have a couple quick things I want to bring to your attention. Last week, we had a, uh, a message on, or, or Wednesday night, we had a class with Joseph Watson on called and really dug into deeply into our giftings and where our callings are in our lives. Uh, and this week, we are, um, it's a Wednesday class, it goes from six to eight, we've got a meal involved, and this, this week is about writing your vision statement. So Joseph uh, will sit down and just walk us through, what does that mean? How do we write this, this vision statement for our lives? So we encourage you to join us, there's Mr. Joseph there. Um, uh, register online at belmont.org. That way we know to have food for you guys at 6 to 8 in the chapel. And then at 6.30 to 8, our youth, well, they open at 6. So our youth are having their Christmas blast off. So I don't know if they name it the blast off, but they did now. Uh, the Christmas blast off. I like that. Um, so it's big party shindig upstairs on the third floor. So invite the kids to come or youth to come to that as well. Christmas Eve. So next week, Carol is leading us with, uh, we've got a choir and just a big celebration Christmas event. Uh, I know, woo! And then Christmas Eve, we've got uh, Carol, Kimber, and Alan Terry leading us. And many of you guys know Dave McKay. He's been a dear friend of this church forever. He's coming in to lend his talents on piano. And uh, Mike has been working on compositions for a string quartet. And Malika Brower's one of the quartet. So we've just got a candlelight service and spoken word and scripture. It's going to be an awesome night, uh, 6 to 7, here in the worship center Christmas Eve, invite some friends, invite a neighbor, invite a coworker. If they don't have anything going on, uh, let's reset our, our plumb line for why it is we celebrate Christmas. And the last thing I just want to follow up on, something you guys did in November was we had all these tables set up and we set out 170 cards to write handwritten notes for DCS employees. Well, last week, there's about a half dozen of us, of us on staff who went to DCS with uh, other churches. It was awesome. We got to partner with Christ Pres and City Church and Gospel Church and uh, I think Brentwood Baptist and Tennessee Kids Belong and House Church, all these different pastors and leaders, uh, which is something that was near and dear to us. But then on top of all that, we were able to distribute these cards. So a car would pull in, and in fact, I've got a shot up there, if you wouldn't mind, Winston. A car would pull in, and, and they gave everybody, get, they got a handwritten card. They got, um, that's the whole team there. Uh, they got a handwritten card, which with the well actually gave us gift cards to put in all these cards. They had a magnet in there to remind them that they were loved. Um, they got a hot cup of coffee, a biscuit. And I mean, these were frontline folks. Uh, in fact, one lady still ha had kids in her. She was transporting, so she came by, so we gave her some extra biscuits. And the great thing was not one person declined prayer. So every person that came through that line, we prayed for, blessed for, shared prophetic words, scriptures. It was awesome. So thank you, guys. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful time, wonderful event. And then whatever cars didn't get distributed were taken back to DCS, and they were handed out to people along with the biscuits as well. So uh, thank you, guys. Just want to follow up. Yeah, amen. We're going to take a minute uh, for meet and greet, and if you have kids, um, they go downstairs if they're 
birth through fourth grade, fifth through ninth grade, go upstairs. And I also want to take a moment and just pray for the offering before we do this. And um, let you guys know, we do have a disaster relief fund as well. So if you feel prompted to give, we will make sure that those funds are used for this disaster that's happening, whether it's in our backyard, whether it's in Kentucky. Uh, you just note that if you write a check, disaster relief, and whatever amount, and then online you can choose uh, disaster relief, okay? So, um, and then of course, ties and offerings, we have the baskets. Uh, we don't have baskets, but you can throw up here on the stage, it's fine, we'll gather them up. Uh, there is one basket, we'll get, oh, there they are, they're hiding behind the poinsettias. Um, or or uh, drop it off, uh, any of the baskets around here are online. So let me pray. Uh, for that and then we'll release our kids and then you guys take a few minutes to greet each other well father lord you are um, a god of amazing provision you are a god of amazing generosity and lord we want to be a people that reflects that so i ask lord that you would stir that father we would have resources to come along people uh, to help i ask father that you would continue to bless the tithes uh, in this house that they would be for your glory and father our faith promise and local outreach those offerings lord may they be multiplied and uh extend the kingdom from here from this corner lord not just in this city but throughout the globe where you've strategically positioned things may it all be for your glory father we love you and we thank you for your faithfulness in jesus name amen take a few minutes we'll be back michael carter will be back with the word
Okay. All right. All right. David, tell him. Tell him. Tell him be quiet. Tell him sit down. Time to start. Okay, somebody with more authority needs to have th this job of getting you to, because I don't have the authority. A sign shall be given a virgin will conceive A human baby bearing undiminished deity The glory of the nations A light for all to see And hope for all who will embrace His warm reality This is your part Come, 
Okay, sing out. time. Sing it to the Lord. I figured since we were in Isaiah, maybe that would work. Uh, maybe that would work. Okay, uh, I don't have a really good title for this. Uh, the, the icky sort of academic title is Joy and Radical Reversal. Okay, uh, another title is Joy, Why? That's the one I like. And, and we can do it, I'll teach you how to say it in Hebrew. Joy is Simcha. And why is ma? ma. Simcha, ma. Simcha. Yeah. So I like that one. It's kind of obscure. Uh, at, at Christmas we sing joy to the world, and I want to ask why. That's what I want to, I want to do this morning. And pray for me, because this is kind of complicated. I'm not used to preaching on a theme. I'm used to going from verse 1 to verse 30, and so... Uh, this is me trying to be a preacher, so pray for me. Don't, no, no. Okay, Kevin, going to have to ask you to leave. Sorry. Uh, if you ever go to Israel, on all the buildings you'll see uh, graffitied, Na Na Nachman. Rabbi Nachman is, a, is a, a sort of a popular uh, leader. Some people even thought he was a Messiah until he died. And then some people said he was going to come back, and he didn't. Uh, but one of the things that he said, let me give it to you in he Hebrew. Mitzvah uh, gedolah lehiot simcha tamid. And this is it in English. Uh, it is a great mitzvah to be joyful. Mitzvah is the word for commandment, or it's something you do to fulfill a commandment. It's a work, something you do. So it's a great mitzvah to be joyful. Amen. To be joyful. Yeah, I think it's a really good saying. Uh, I think I have, do you have my slide that has, no. you don't, okay, all right. Well, I had this really cool slide, you would have loved it, that, uh, <laughs> that shows simcha in uh, Hebrew. Um, there are other five or six other words in Hebrew that mean joy, but that's the most prevalent one, uh, 98 times in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's almost always related to singing, which I think is interesting. And uh, it, it really is sort of the, the chief uh, religious um, observance is to be joyful. Uh, if, if you know anything about Judaism, you know one of the biggest celebrations of the year is Simcha Torah. It's the joy of the Torah. And you see pictures from um, synagogues. Whenever you see pictures of people dancing around and they got the scrolls, they're hugging the scrolls and they're kissing the scrolls and they're going, that's Simcha Torah. It's the joy of the Torah. And I wish we did this in, in, uh, in Christianity. They have a, a program where they read through the Torah in a year. And you celebrate Simcha Torah when you're done. When you've read, when everyone has all read the Bible together, they have this big celebration. I mean, what would it be like if we were dancing in the aisles and holding our Bibles and 
I don't know, that might be a pretty cool thing. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's a little background on uh, joy. Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs uh, says that in Judaism, joy is the supreme religious emotion. Joy, deep joy. And I'm gonna try to show you that from Isaiah and from Mary, Jesus' mother, and from uh, Jesus himself. So Isaiah, someone's already mentioned seven, 700 years ago, he was talking about uh, the coming of Jesus. Uh, did you know that in Hebrews 11:37, the person that's referred to as being sawed in half, that's probably Isaiah. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I learned something. Uh, he prophesied the coming of Jesus in remarkable detail, did Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 7:14 that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Uh, he even prophesied in, in chapter 43 and 5, John the Baptist. Uh, and the story of Jesus always begins with the story of John the Baptist. Um, in uh, 53.3, he, he pr uh, prophesied that Jesus would be rejected by his own people. Uh, in 53.12, he said that he would be crucified with criminals. Um, in 53.9, notice how these come from chapter 53, uh, that he would be buried with the rich and that uh, he would be a sacrifice for sin. Uh, of all the prophets, Isaiah speaks the most about joy. Uh, the, the, the word simcha appears, I said this before, 89 times in the Hebrew Bible. 36 of those are in Isaiah. Yeah, so he's very interested in, in joy. Uh, if, in, just in case you're interested, I've, I've, done my home, I've done your homework for you. You're welcome. Uh, I, uh, Jeremiah uses it 11 times. It's only 13 times in the Psalms. Come on. That makes no sense. So uh, Isaiah says things like this. Um, this is 9.3. You've enlarged the nation, increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Isaiah 12.3, this is a very important one. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Remember we talked about that in John 7 when Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles. The high priest before this crowd of that tens of thousands of people in the 35-acre courtyard around the temple, the high priest quotes Isaiah 12, 3 and says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. What does Jesus shout from the back of the crowd? If a man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. How cool is that? <laughs> uh, 24, 8, uh, the joyful tambourines are still. The noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful harp is silent. So that's kind of the opposite. And uh, well, I was going to share something personal, but I won't do that. Uh, Isaiah 26, 19, but your dead will live. Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Uh, 44, 23, sing for joy, you heavens. See, it's off, often connected with singing. Uh, sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests and all your trees, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. This is 49, 13. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountain. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. This is 52, 9. Burst into songs of joy together, the ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. And finally, 65, 14. My servants will sing out for the joy of their hearts but you will cry out from anguish of heart and wail in brokenness and cry. So earlier when we were lighting the candles, we read those two passages from Isaiah 35 and 40. We could have read 36 more. There are 36 more passages we could have read. Um, Isaiah is called in chapter six, you know, that's the famous here am I, send me, Lord, passage. And it's interesting to me that joy doesn't appear until chapter eight. In, in Isaiah. So it's when his ministry gets started that he starts talking about joy. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, and this beautiful classical Hebrew, uh, he pleads and he cries out to four different kings and a multitude of others, some who listen, most, most who don't. For 66 chapters, he prophesies for the Lord. He warns of destruction, but he always promises simcha, joy. Uh, and we'll, I'll, get back, I'll get back to that in a minute. Now let's jump ahead seven, 700 years. Um, 
I call this a song of radical reversal. This is Mary's song in uh, Luke. Um, we know that Luke is interested in songs. He, he opens his gospel. Everyone's singing in Luke. And uh, we, we think that may have something to do with his life situation, but we're not really sure. But one of the coolest things, when you're reading Luke and passages from the nativity, the season, remember that Mary is his source. He tells us in, in uh, uh, chapter 1 that he, he wasn't an eyewitness, but he spoke to eyewitnesses. And when you read the nativity sections of uh, the Gospel of Luke, he knows what Mary's thinking and what she's feeling. Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. And we believe that Luke wrote his Gospel in Ephesus. And guess who is in Ephesus with John? Mary. So there's a very good chance that this account uh, is from Mary herself. It's told from her perspective, which I think is un unbelievable. So I'm going to start in chapter 1, uh, verse 26 of Luke. In the sixth month, God sent the, oh, there's Simcha. You found it. There it is. Isn't that beautiful? Simcha. Nobody get, I don't want to hear anybody getting a tattoo of that, okay? Take that down before someone. <laughs> there, thank you. Yeah. Look, I heard what you said. I got this tattoo. Uh, don't do that. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, now that's the six months of, of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy. We're counting off to the birth of John the Baptist. Jesus' story always begins with John the Baptist. He prepares the way, right? How do you prepare the way for Jesus? You make people realize that they, they need to be forgiven, right? And all through Jesus' ministry, we have people falling down at his feet. Peter falls down in Luke 6, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. Why does Peter do that? He's heard the preaching of John the Baptist. We need to appreciate this, the impact and how perfectly John prepared the way uh, for Jesus. So uh, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin placed to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name, and that Greek, if, if you care about this, in Greek, that's Parthenos. And we have the Parthenon. That's the word Parthenos. You're thinking, who cares? Okay. Uh, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, when Mary remembers and tells us this story, she tells us her response, that she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. That sort of tells you something about Mary. This angel appears. The, uh, the Bible says he looked like a man. So I'm, I don't think he's standing there with big wings. I think he just he looks like a person. And... Uh, Greetings, you who are highly favored. And Mary's the sort of person that goes, what does that mean? What are you talking about? Okay. She was greatly troubled and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, and this is what angels always say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Uh, me phobu, no fear, no fear. Uh, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor. I wish we had time to talk about that. Uh, that's the Hebrew word hen, which is a, another big, big category. Maybe we'll talk about that someday. Uh, you will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Yeshua, Jesus. Yahweh saves. That's what it means. What other name could he have had? Yeah. Uh, he will be great, and he will be called the son of El Elyon, the God who's above all other gods. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. We just heard that Joseph was a descendant of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Let me help you with that phrase, because that phrase always bugged me. Kingdom, that's like a, 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 a physical place. When the Bible says, talks about the kingdom not ending, it means the reign won't end. His kingdom, his reign will never end. When Jesus announces the good news that the kingdom has come, he's basically saying the reign of God has begun. Okay, that's what that means. So his kingdom will never end. His reign uh, will, uh, will never end. How can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. See, you're, you're an angel. I don't know what it's like in heaven, but down here, it's, you know, 
Biologically, this is not making sense. And again, isn't it cool that she stood up for herself and said, well, hold on, this isn't gonna work, okay? I'm not, uh, the angel said, and I love the gentleness of his response, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of, there it is again, El Elyon, most high, will overshadow you. And that's the same Greek word that's used in the Septuagint, the old Greek translation of the uh, Hebrew Bible, of the Spirit of, the, of God hovering over the waters in creation. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Uh, that's Genesis 1-2. It's, it's a practical description of what's about to happen to her. The Holy Spirit is going to hover over her. Um, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative. What does that mean? That means John and Jesus are cousins. Come on, they're related. How cool is that? Even Elizabeth, your, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. Uh, and she was said to be barren is in her sixth month for nothing is impossible with God. That's a little jab at Sarah from Genesis 8, 14, who said, is anything impossible for God? And this tells us everything we need to know about Mary, her response to this incredible statement. What does she say? I'm the Lord's servant. I'm the Lord's servant. And... Um, yeah, I'm the Lord's servant. The, uh, uh, Mary answered, may it be to me as you've said. Then the angel left her. She sees herself, and it really could be translated slave. I'm the slave of the master is another way to translate it. At that time, Mary uh, got ready and hur hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah uh, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, the six month baby leaps in uh, her womb uh, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, Mary remembered, she's really loud, shouted this. In a loud voice she exclaimed, blessed are you among women. And what you need to know in Judaism, praying is basically learning how to bless things, okay? Baruch atah, blessed art thou. So blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord, new circumlocution, Jesus is the mother of our Lord, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ear, the baby in my womb leaped for Simcha, joy. She, he just, he comes, I mean, at this point, okay, John's a six, six month uh, infant. Everybody gets mad when I say fetus. Is that bad? Because that's what he is, okay. Uh, Jesus at this point is a zygote. <laughs> no, in, 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 taking, in taking seriously the humanity of Jesus, he's a zygote. At this, he's just barely uh, this little, a few cells in his mother's womb. And John gets close, and he starts jumping up and down. If you've had children, you know what that's like. Um, I've watched it happen. I've watched it happen. Um, he, he leaped in my womb for joy. And here it comes, another blessing. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Wonderful. We're getting a wonderful image of Mary. And so what, is, what does Mary do? She starts singing. She bursts into song, and, uh, and this is her song. And what this really is, this is a rebirth of Old, Old Testament prophecy, because most of the prophets, there's this, the, the statement is, bring in the musicians so that I may prophesy. A lot of prophecy was done to music. It was, it wasn't, it was lyrical, it was at least lyrical. And so she bursts into this song, and Mary said, um, my soul praises the Lord, and my spirit Rejoices. There's our joy. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble slave, estate of his slave, Dulos. Dulane is the female form. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. That's El Shaddai. Holy is his name. His mercy, and this is probably Chesed, 
Hesed is when the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. That's God's mercy. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And, and here comes a list of God's past work. She is saturated in scripture, Jesus' mother. And so she can sing these kind of songs. He's performed mighty deeds with his arms. He, his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And here comes what I want to focus on. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. That's radical reversal. He's turned everything upside down, okay? Those, the, the rulers on their throne he's brought down, but the humble he's lifted up. This fills Mary with joy that God is turning the world upside down. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Now, Jesus will repeat that later on in the Beatitudes. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abram and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. So there's her song. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months. That adds up to nine. And so I guess John's about to be born, so she goes, she goes home. Uh, my note says, in Mary's song, we see the first stirrings of radical reversal of the fact that the Lord is turning the world upside down. But Isaiah had sung about it. Let me give you some of those references. I did your homework for you. Isaiah 29, 19. Uh, and notice these, these, song, these uh, passages all talk about joy. Uh, Once more the humble will rejoice, the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Uh, this is 35, six. Then the lame will leap like deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness. There's even radical reversal geographically. The, the wilderness turns into this uh, wonderful uh, streams in the desert uh, kind of business. That's 35, six. Uh, this is 35, 10. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. See what happens? Joy overtakes them, and sorrow runs away. Radical reversal. Uh, he's turning the world upside down. Um, this is 51.3. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden. See? Her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Radical reversal. Things are being turned upside down. Sing, barren woman. You who never bore a child, burst into song. Shout for joy. You, will, uh, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman uh, than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Radical reversal for, you know, fertility in the, out in the wilderness and, and fertility at home for the barren, those who are barren. Although you have been, this is 6015, although you have been forsaken and hated with no one traveling through, I will make you the everlasting pride and joy of all generations. Talking about Israel. And the, finally, 61.3, and, uh, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. So there it is, see, radical reversal. Mary's, Mary's filled with joy, she rejoices because those who are, who are set on thrones are being brought down and the lowly are being lifted up and that fills her with joy. That people that are filled are going away hungry, but the hungry are being filled. She's the sort of person, and so is Isaiah, who, um, who celebrates those things. So let's finally come to Jesus. Um, we, we only have one passage where Jesus is described as being joyful. Did you know that? Uh, I did your homework for you, and I have all of the adjectives that describe Jesus' emotions. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, let, me give, uh, let me give some of them to you. I won't read them all. 
um, beginning with Mark, um, he's moved, 141, he's moved with compassion. Now, I think that must be the most common description. He strongly warns, I think that's the, the man with the hand, uh, looking around in anger five times uh, in the Gospels. Um, he sternly warned. He gave strict orders. In 6.6, 6, he marvels. Uh, in 6.34, he has compassion. Uh, five times, he sighs deeply. Now, I get that, right? No one understands what he's doing. John the Baptist, who leapt in his mother's womb, is going to send Jesus a question. And what's the question? Are you the Messiah or should we live for someone else? Can you believe that? Mary, at one point, thinks he's out of his mind. She's come to take him away from himself. He's beside himself. Um, anyway, uh, so, yeah. He deeply sighed in his spirit. That's 8.12. He strongly ordered. Uh, he rebukes Peter. He's indignant. Uh, and that's a word that only Mark uses to describe Jesus. And in 14.34, he's deeply grieved. Um, that's Mark. Listen to Matthew. 8.10, Jesus is astonished or amazed. Uh, and that's the, the story of the centurion. There are two things that amaze Jesus, faith and the lack of faith. Okay? Because what happens? The centurion asks for what he doesn't deserve. My servant's sick. Um, you know, could you come and heal him? And um, I'm, I don't deserve to have you come to my house. Just say the word. And Jesus is amazed at that. Wouldn't you love to amaze Jesus someday? Wow. Mike, I did not see that coming. Wow. <laughs> no. But then the other thing, he's amazed when people don't believe. He's amazed at their lack of faith. So there's, uh, he's astonished or amazed. And again, 9, 936, I'm in Matthew now. He has compassion. There are three passages in a row, he speak, speaks of Jesus having compassion. Uh, of being sorrowful and troubled when he says his soul is overwhelmed. Okay, that's uh, Matthew. Here's Luke. In 435, Jesus said sternly. Uh, again, in 7, 9, same story. He's amazed at the centurion. Uh, at the widow of Nain, his heart went out to her. You know that story. In Jewish funerals, the women always go first because the rabbis had decreed, because of you, sin, came, sin and death came into the world, so you will go first in the funerals. Make you feel good about yourself, ladies? So we know that when the funeral procession for the widow of Nain is leaving Nain, she's in the front. And Jesus and his disciples are coming into town and Jesus is in, in front. And these two groups meet, you know. Uh, I love that story. But he sees her and his heart goes out to her. Um, he strictly warns the disciples in chapter 9. In 951, major turning point, he resolutely sets his face for Jerusalem. Sometimes we translate that. He set his face like a flint for Jerusalem, and that's the final journey. That's the great central section of Luke from chapter 9 to 19. Most of Luke is Jesus walking to Jerusalem for the last time. Um, and now I'm going to skip that one because that's one we're going to look at. In 2244, he's in anguish. In John, he's fairly unemotional. He's most emotional in Mark. There are more adjectives describing him. Uh, and there's kind of a wider range of his emotions in Mark. I think that's because the source of Mark is Peter. And who, who knows more about Jesus' emotions than Peter? Who's on the receiving end, for good and for bad, more than Peter? So he remembers that. John, uh, there are only four times his emotions are described in all those 21 chapters of John. I think that's important. I don't know why, but I think it's important. In 4.6, he's tired. In 11.33, he's deeply moved. In 12.27, he says, now my heart is troubled. And in 13.21, he is deeply troubled. But I want to look at what may very well be one of the most important passages um, next to the crucifixion and the resurrection. One of the most important passages, and we read right past it. And uh, it's in Luke 10. Um, the 70 have been sent out. Only Luke tells us of the 70. 
and uh, they have come back and they are rejoicing. He had given them his authority and they had cast out demons and they preached the good, the good news, Jesus' work and Jesus' word, okay? And everyone's rejoicing. And um, so this word is addressed to the, to, the, uh, to the 70. And this is Luke 10, 16. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. This is their, the formal office that they have as apostles. It, the Hebrew word is sheliach. Uh, the the, the sheliach is the authoritative representative of the person that sent him. So if they say no to the apostles, it's like they're saying no to Jesus. In fact, it's kind of the same thing because they are representing, they are his authoritative representatives, okay? So um, he's summing that up there. Very, it's an old Hebrew term. Um, the 72 returned with joy, there it is, and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. What must that have been like to go out and exercise? It's not their authority, it's Jesus' authority. It's not their word, it's Jesus' word. And they come back and demons have submitted. Um, they submitted to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority. There, there's more of that Sheliak language. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. That's a reason for joy. And here's the verse, okay, uh, finally, finally here. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Now, it, this is the only time he's ever described this way. Full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. What's that? Radical reversal. You've turned the world upside down and, and it, it fills Isaiah with joy, it fills Mary with joy, it fills Jesus with joy. You've hidden these things from the wise. The wise people have been oppressing Jesus' his whole ministry. And you've revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for that was your good pleasure. So here comes my conclusion. Isaiah, Mary, Jesus. It's not enough to simply say that at some point they were filled with joy, that they rejoiced. We need to ask why. Why were they joyful? What filled their hearts with joy? The answer is through his son, God is turning the world upside down. He is radically reversing the old order and the power of sin. Rulers are brought low while the humble are lifted up. The hungry are filled and the rich are sent away empty. Those who weep will laugh and the laughing ones will mourn. So let me, let me uh, mess up this hymn for you forever. Joy to the world. The Lord has come to turn the world upside down, to turn your world upside down and mine. Amen. The, as the music guys come, thank you. I was supposed to say as the musicians are coming. Oh, here they come. stand and sing just a little bit of that that carol that we sing oh come all ye faithful uh, just to just to send us out oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore Christ the Lord's 
sing it one more time. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. His name shall be wonderful counselor his name shall be the everlasting father his name shall be the prince of peace mighty god his name shall be to my family in probably 10 years. I haven't seen my children in that time either. So um, I came last Sunday um, and prayed with uh, Mimi and with Mary Beth and we prayed about um, prayed about that situation because it was so hopeless. Um, my family hadn't answered the phone um, or anything in years and uh, that was Sunday. So, um, Monday morning, I get a, a call from my mother, and <laughs> she asked me if I would like to come spend Christmas with them yeah. and with my children. <laughs> so, I just say that to say that um, God is so mighty and absolute <laughs> radical reversal and I haven't been in her house in probably 15 years and I asked her I said should I get a hotel room you know in the area and she thought about it for a minute and she said no she said you can stay here mm. so yeah so and um, I'm just um, there's hope uh, and I came to them so hopeless I had no hope left. I had been praying and praying and praying, but I just felt like it was such a hopeless situation. And just like she said to me, my mom was not the authority. My mom was not the end all say all, God was. And that was where I was, that's where it changed when I came to him and, and asked him to do this instead of, you know, trying to call her and she wouldn't answer and send letters and begging, please let me talk to them, let me, somebody see me, you know. Um, and that, that, that Sunday, when we asked God, Monday, God did it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Belmont, thank you for praying for us. What's that? 
I said, Beaumont, thank you for praying for us. Yes. yes. We yes. love you. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, yeah, let's pray and just tell the Lord, Lord, thank you that um, your joy overturns our sadness. Thank you, Father, that you, uh, Lord, you change things in 24 hours like that. And I just, I pray, Lord, specifically for this, that Jamie would just have an amazing uh, rest, restoration, uh, reconnection. Uh, that, Father, anything that was stolen from the past would be restored and then some. And, Lord, I also pray that for, uh, I just sense, Lord, even people, uh, there's somebody online, Lord, who is, uh, wrestling with family as well as they go into this this Christmas season. And uh, Jesus, I pray you would stir hope right now uh, in their hearts, hope in the in the other families' hearts. Lord, I pray that in my own family, Lord, wherever there is a brokenness, that Jesus, you would stir in hearts. So Father, stir in hearts, Lord, of our families. Lord, in anywhere there's been breakdown or uh, offense or um, just family drama, Lord, anything that is not your will, in Jesus' name, we break it off of family lines right now. And we just say, Lord, joy overturns sadness. So, Father, stir in hearts. Come forth, joy. Come forth, Jesus. Now, listen, we've got prayer teams over to my left here that will be glad to pray with you today. Um, we encourage you to come forth for prayer. Uh, we love you guys. We love you guys. Uh, we look to see you Wednesday. Now go in the name of Jesus and spread joy. Amen. Bless you guys. Oh uh -huh.